us realize just how valuable the horseshoe crab is. When I first started 37 years ago, we were allowed to harvest them. There was no uh, recording, there was nothing. And they became fair game, and I was involved with selling them for bait. And then a doctor came down, and he said that if I didn't sell bait crabs anymore, he would be interested in the laboratory. Normal fishing is, you know, you catch it, you ice it, and you deliver it to the table and you eat it. The horse, as we actually catch them, take them to the lab, and they bleed them, and we bring them back and release them. So we're borrowing the crabs is really what we're doing. There we go. A little bit. All right. Crabs that are borrowed end up a couple of hours away at the Endosafe Laboratories in Charleston. Here in this alien world, they're given a rigorous cleaning to prep them for the process ahead. For the past 30 years, the biomedical industry has been mining the medical equivalent of gold. Endosafe is one of only four labs in the world that produces a derivative of horseshoe crab blood. Their blood has a clotting agent that's used to detect minute levels of bacteria. But what's truly surprising is the color. The crab's blue blood is an evolutionary gift that's helped them survive the eons. Male or female? Uh, small male would be good. Okay. Dr. Norman Wainwright has been working with horseshoe crabs for most of his career, studying the remarkable properties of their blood. The beautiful blue color is a result of its blood containing copper as an oxygen-carrying pigment instead of hemoglobin, which contains iron. I'm hitting a suspension of E. coli bacteria. At the first sign of bacteria, the crab's blood forms a protective clot. Look at that. This is, this is perfect. This is the horseshoe crab cells protecting the animal from infection. Any type of leakage of seawater into their blood system would trigger this response, seal the wound, and there actually are proteins in the clot itself that kill the bacteria. They're almost primitive antibiotics. The phenomenon caught the attention of the biomedical community in the 70s. They've been putting it to work for us ever since. Up to a third of the crab's blood is removed during the process, yet most of them survive. One quart of horseshoe crab blood is worth about $15,000. It's a multi-million dollar industry. All right, it's probably, most of y'all have never heard of that, all right? Horseshoe crab blood. What color is it? Blue. 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 What does it do? I want to make sure you understand what it does. Anybody? What is it? it helps to clot um, around bacteria. So basically, if our blood was just like this, we could fight off even more bacteria because it would clot around any bacteria that came, any coals or anything like that. So they use it to test out a lot of things um, to make sure that the bacteria is not on there. Mother Wednesday. What country was it? It's ours. We use it all around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Blue. You, you know, uh, in the laboratories, they use it all over, all over the world now, uh, coming from the blood. So the power of the blood. Now, this is what got me. How much was it? $15,000 for that little quart of blood. It got amazing. God did it. He made sure that we would have those things, and that's why the sanctity of the blood is so important. If somebody will pay $15,000 for horseshoe crab blood, I'm telling you, think what price God gave for his son on that cross and shedding his blood for us to buy us. Let's jump into this section. Yes, Mother May. Um, we've got a, a, a pre-doctor dentist in here. Um, you've got oxygenated blood. You've got the arteries that go from one place, but it's not actually blue. All right. Um, you 
call it blue blood, but that's actually a misnomer, if I'm not mistaken, from my sister, because I've bled, and others have bled with arteries, and the blood is still red. But that whole process of oxygenation, like when you look at, for you, you're, you're um, lighter than I am, so you can see your veins, and it looks blue simply as it goes with those veins. But when it bleeds, it's always red. All right. No, it's the picture they're looking at your veins, but I um, just want to make sure. Angie, did I get that right? Science teacher. Science teacher? It's red. It's red. All right, so we got a science teacher in here that agrees with that, but I have heard that and did some studies on it, but that craft blood is blue, all right? That is blue, but when we look at our veins, it seems we see the different colors, so great. That's awesome. Power in the blood. Let's go ahead and jump into this section and get all those questions. Let's go to Leviticus 17, 5 through 9. Need some readers tonight. We're just going to kind of press through. Someone read, please. To the end of the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meat, to the priests, and offer them as peace offerings to the Lord. And the priests shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of Jesus, and burn the fat from the sweet aroma to the Lord. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to me, after whom they have made the harlot. This shall be a statute forever for them, throughout their generations. Also you shall say to them, whatever man of the house of Israel or of the stranger, who dwell among you, who offer a burnt offering or sacrifice, and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among them. Wow. Powerful scripture when we begin to sum it up, when we begin to look at that. Um, in that commentary, there are several reasons for this regulation. Negatively, it prevents sacrifices unto what? unto demons or devils, and we're going to deal with that uh, just uh, momentarily. Um, out in the open field, and we see that at verse 7, verse 5, uh, Israel apparently picked up a good bit of idolatry in Egypt, and this had to be ended. So if you've been with me on Sunday, at least 11 o'clock service, we've been talking about uh, that exodus, and we've been leaving Egypt. Um, we're in the water now. We're going across the Red Sea, but they took a lot of idol worship, and so the Egyptians... Um, would actually offer things to demons. Um, I do want to um, talk about this just a little bit to know that demons are real. All right, demons are real, angels are real, God is real. Um, a lot of people talk about the devil. Uh, my granddad, before we went to see Jesus, he was, he was singing, I got the devil under my feet. And it is, it's a great song and one, but you just don't want to play with the devil. Uh, you don't want to play with the, thank God for the blood of Jesus, we can rebuke him. But I see sometimes so many people are talking more about the devil than they are Jesus and his blood and what he's done. So we don't want to um, 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 get caught up in that. Um, in churches sometimes they're casting out demons. But what we have not taught on this, when you cast out a demon, you don't kill that demon. That demon exits one person and it begins to look for somebody else. So again, if you're in a service where a demon is cast out, you better watch out. You better make sure you got your own self right. And I've seen this. I've seen it tear up churches because they don't know what they're dealing with. They're casting out. And the devil's just laughing because that demon is dispersing and going, and it's just going from one person to another. Um, let's look at this uh, next part, this question. In your opinion, what things are offered to demons today? This is a, a, your opinion. What things are offered to demons today? All right, in people's lives, in what respect? Okay, With the way they live, um, I, I think we can encompass that. Um, drugs, opioids, all these things where people are literally, I'm seeing them break down. I'm just seeing they give their whole life to this. It's, it's beyond the drug, the demon takes over. And, and, and they offer their life. That, that's so good. What are it? Tattoos and music. All right, ooh, that's a touchy one, huh? Yeah. Um, I, I, I do. I think there is a transition uh, with tattoos. I think that 
Um, you can have a tattoo and not automatically pick up a demon, but when you do tattoos, you do open up a gateway because there is an exchange of what? Blood. And so that whole thing, of course, with anything else, some people have taken other things, so it's just not the gateway of tattoos. What else did you say? Music. Music. Yeah. Ear gate. Now, that's a big thing with my, my kids, you know, listening, other kids, other people. Can music affect us? Yes, it does affect us. Can demons enter in there? I believe eye gates, ear gates, whatever we allow to come in, even in our mind, and we open up ourselves, demons can be there. Now, I tend to believe that if you are a Christian, that you cannot be possessed by demons. But demons sure can be around you a lot. All right? They can sure irritate you like flies. I, I believe that, that you can't be possessed according to scriptures. But you got to make sure that you're saved, for one. And there are some people that have been possessed by demons fully, partially, or a part of them. And um, I think it's, it is. It's a very scary and dangerous thing. Deacon Rose. Our clothes. Demons. All right. Our, our clothes. clothes. Okay. I think we as Christians shouldn't, shouldn't go as the world do, so to speak. And they're putting them up on the signboards, you know, and not only on the TVs, but on the highways. Different spheres. You got to ask yourself, what determines trends? Now I don't want to get into it because we get in trouble. We got on legal terms on last time. We have to be careful. But there is a spirit of antichrist in the world today. All right. And so, if there is a spirit of antichrist in the world today, then that is affecting our world. Demonic powers are actually coming in and shaping our mindsets, our clothing, the things that we consume, things of that sort. I think that you, you can argue what it is and what it is, but you got to know that that is what the scriptures talk about. Yes, sir? I was, I was going to say, going back to the years, I know in particular back in the, the 60s, uh, a lot of the rock bands, a lot of the directors, they got their music, they were going to act in church and they were writing their music. You know, personalities that came on a person that began to write this, you know, a lot, a lot of music that we hear that, that uh, and it gives us that that we don't, don't realize. So true. Um, some of you, new movie out, um, Bohemian Rhapsody. I'm talking about Queen. Some of you grew up with Queen. If you don't know, then don't worry about it. But we are the champions, my friend. You've heard that, that song. And so that whole thing you'll see within that movie that there are a lot of drugs, mm -hmm. alcoholism. And so when you drink, you don't automatically get a demon. Right. But what happens, you open yourself up. And if you've ever had drugs, your inhibitions go down. Mm -hmm. So you would do things that you wouldn't normally do. Right. Maybe are with people that you're... Uh, normal with, which leads me to another point off in our life, um, sexual acts. Um, you open up yourself to demons. The scriptures say, do you not know when you sleep with a harlot that actually that demon is transferred to you? That is scary. And so you're thinking in a physical connection, but also looking, pornography, we talked about that, that porno is a spirit. It's actually, when you look at it in the Greek, it's a spirit that can actually attack our mind, and addictions are coming from that. So we're turning ourselves over, offering um, um, these these things to demons. Any else? Can I get all the hands? I yes, sir. Hope, I believe this is the deal, the top of the list. Abuse. Okay. In school or at home. The, our leaders have said you can't just pass your child the way the Bible tells us to. You got to do it the way the Lord says. All right. And prove one. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? Just All right. Pass. All right. So you, the you know, way we we are changing how we train up our kids, and it's coming into our schools. And I and I think we can all agree. Things are done differently in schools. When you go in, uh, we got some school teachers here. There's really not a whole bunch you can do to discipline a child. And there's a spirit, even in kids now, uh, just that, that mannish attitude in some that you're like, this is just not... Because you, when you see a little kid, you think you're four or five years old, 
they can be, you know, a little hard-headed at times, but this is a different type. They say things that, you're like, where did that come from? You, you work with the, the nursery and things of that sort. I really think those are demons and spirits, and we're offering our children uh, to demons. Uh, in the Old Testament, they would actually take their physical kids and offer them to an idol by burning them. All right? They were burning them. So if we compare some of us, if you've been involved um, with abort, uh, uh, aborting a child, uh, maybe you didn't know or not, but I believe that's offering um, children to demons in a physical way, simply because we're not believing God can provide, and therefore when we abort that child, that's what the devil wants. He wants to cut off the plan for some's life. And that's what demons do. Their whole purpose is to cut life short. That's one less person that can be saved. One, one more person that's added to hell and torment. So these demon powers. Um, if you've ever been some places, you know, certain parts of towns or nightclubs, you can sense, if you're a Christian, you can sense there's a change. Or if you're almost Christian, if you're, there, there's certain places you can go and certain people, I can sense demonic presence. I can sense it. It's just, it's a troubling when I'm in that place. I'm like, something's not right. I, I've sensed it in churches before. I've gone and I'm like, something's not right. Something's not right here. It just doesn't feel right. And that's the demonic presence. As I can feel God's power and his anointing and the Holy Spirit coming in in a powerful way, there's a freedom. But when you're around a, a demonic, uh, a demon, it's an oppression. It feels like kind of chains and it's just thick. It's a thick feel, kind of like a humid day. You know, you're on a real humid day, and you can just feel the, 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 the humidity of the water that's in the air. That's that demonic oppression that's around. Um, also, in certain groups, you have to be careful, because where there's exchange of, of fluids and people coming together in that way, demonic demons, they love it. They just kind of jump back and forth. It's kind of like roaches just running through houses. And your neighbor, you got to be careful. They got roaches, and they call the Terminator in their in their house to clean up the roaches. And you live next door. Guess what the roaches do? The roaches they looking for a new house, and they leave that house that's been clean, and they go right to the other house. That is the same way. There's transfer of demons, so we must be careful. Mom. I think that the way the world is today that. That so much is opened up now as non-spiritual, like where I work, there's so many homosexuals, there's so many different ones coming in, and, and, and our nation, our government, we're not standing, we're supposed to be a viable country, but, you know, we're not standing up to it. We're letting everything come and everything go. We let it in the church, we let it everywhere. Therefore, if those adults and everything is going to do it, our children are going to be coming up to all this stuff, too. And if we as Christians don't stand up to some of this stuff, um, we, our leadership, there used to be a time that we could call out something that was different. But now, politically correct, if you, if you say somebody filled with a demon, boy, you, you go to jail. Um, or what if a demon is speaking and everybody can sense that? Now it's seen as free speech. You know, it's, it's okay, all these things. And you can sense, what if a demon, and we've studied it um, through the New Testament, is tormenting someone? You know, in, encapsulating that person and the demon has taken over, it is becoming more prevalent in our society. I'm looking at some of the young people uh, that are shooting the people. And, and when you get the pictures of them, you can look at them and you see that they are like, what happened? You could tell something that was a disconnect with them. And then some of them are so blatant, it's almost like a demon is staring at you. They're just empty. They've been eaten out. The core has been eaten out of them. Demonic spirits within our society. Yes, sir. I, I, don't, I don't know how this would tie in, but uh, uh, I think I think I'll, I'll die and, and uh, the kind of food we eat now. Because I, I can't understand when we came up, we ate uh, we ate pork, we ate beef, but the obesity uh, wasn't as prevalent. <coughs> okay. But now it is, and, and I, I, I don't know if because it's the fast food obesity, and they put other chemicals in it that we didn't put on the farm. I just, I just noticed it. It's a big change. We could be opening ourselves up to 
I, I guess, the demon of obesity. Yeah. Um, and I am concerned. There has been some scientific um, studies that um, uh, companies in the past had put in things that make us want it more, yeah. like sugar. Right? Sugar. I, I never forget, I, I'm talking about this, I was looking at Little House on the Prairie, and, and um, whatever his name, what's the guy's name, the daddy's name? Charles. Charles. He brings home a little cube. Little cube. And this was their, like, Christmas present. And the family was sitting around in a circle by the firelight with a little cube of sugar. And, and he was like, Daddy, you shouldn't have brought it home. And they share a little piece of sugar, and they were just excited. Man, we got bags of sugar. We got brown sugar. We got white sugar. We got sugar and everything. But in our society now, just about everything you eat has sugar in it. And that taste, and if you've ever been on longer fast, you start to realize how much sugar is in stuff. Because when you come out, you go to any restaurant, there's a taste of sugar. You can taste it. Now, once you get used to it, you get used to it, just like salt, right? Right? You come off the of salt, you can taste salt better and stuff. But when you eat salt, you just, I know somebody in my family, they shake salt before they even taste them. They're like, well, I know it's going to be some more salt. In Jesus' name. And they just go ahead and put the salt on. But that is, again, we open ourselves up, and I think um, spirits can and take over. Um, the biggest loser. Did we ever have any programs like that? When I was growing up, I'm just thinking back, I did have TV. Some of y'all didn't have TV. I had TV. We didn't have programs like that. Now, were there big people? Yeah, they were big people, but it didn't seem as prevalent as it is now. So, good point. Any more? It's good. Um, I, I can't remember the Greek word, but it means psychos, and in that, it's the same thing as the doctors coming up um, with opioids or any kind of drugs that bring euphoria, and, and maybe that's what's happening. We're putting stuff in our food that brings euphoria. So we say we shouldn't do cocaine, but we're putting some kind of other cocaine stuff into our food. Because people do act crazy. You ever went to um, um, Golden Corral, that we talked about it? People are different at Golden Corral. I'm, I'm there, and it's just like, you just, it's just this whole, maybe there is some, maybe there are demons in Golden Corral. I think I preached that. Yeah, people start leaving. There was there, but always there. I was going to say, maybe we need to get a shot of that blue blood. <laughs> that blue blood we talked about, that crab blood. That blood. Where do you think, and this is kind of open it up, I gotta get to these next scriptures. Where do you think demons would like to hang out most? This, this is an opinion, I don't, I don't have any scriptures for it. Somebody say church. <laughs> well, they shouldn't if God's power and anointing is in the church. They should really want to hang out in the church, but I guess that's a possibility. Mother Winston? Leadership. Good. Scripture comes to mind. Rules of darkness, principalities, high places. So the, the demons, the big demons, because we know they're hierarchies of demons. They are. You got the devil. He's just one. He cannot multiply himself. There's only one devil. Please note that. But he has a lot of demons. Demons are what? What are demons? How were demons, demons created? Where do they come from? Yeah. Fallen angels. All right. So he has demons under him. And just as God has angels, he has Michael, the archangel. So does the devil have demons that are more powerful than other demons. So uh, we got to be careful. Somebody said, I fought with the devil. Most of the time, none of us are going to fight with the devil. We just, he ain't too concerned about us. Now, we may have a low-level demon. We got a fly demon. You know, he just, he just irritating us. Because think about it, we can't just control some base natures. Why, why is he going to send a principality 
No, that he wouldn't need to. He's already got us control with those base things. So, very good point. Brother Rick. I, I was just going to say, I, I think of cities like uh, uh, Las Vegas and New Orleans where they have a good time. <laughs> the freeness where people are willing to open themselves up right. for, for demonic presence to come in. Have to be very careful with that time. Alcohol, they're addicted to all these things. What better way to get so many people in the movies we watch, the music we listen to, everything that we look up to comes from a certain amount of people? I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Just now. Okay, so I'm sort of going to agree with you with the whole for sort of tattoo thing because, yeah, think about different indigenous religions. They do tend to mark themselves and give skin sacrifices in their different rituals okay. so to invite spirits in. And so I have been in some tattoo shops where I'm like, yeah, I can't be here. But then there are other ones where I'm like, okay, this is a little bit better. Because, you know, I could be in tattoo shops for like, you know, 17 hours at a time. So, so there is an agreeing that yeah. it does open. And since we've got somebody, it's, it's a study. Tattoos can become addicted. You can, you can become okay. addicted to getting tattoos. And I'm like, you, you got to wonder why. Why is that? How can that become addictive? And I think we have to, just as anything else, I, I think there can be a spirit of shopping, a demon that just wants to spend all our money and get us in debt, and it's influenced us. But there are many types of demons. Demons' purpose is to get us off track from God, to kill us, and to advance the devil's plan. Not God's plan, but to advance hell. So anything that goes against God's plan is, is the enemy. Is somehow the Antichrist is influenced that. And that is our world at this point. I really believe a spirit of Antichrist is arising. And eventually the Antichrist will rise as a world leader. And people will bow down and follow that personality. We're, we're not talking about someone with a whip and a... Uh, uh, you know, look like a, a devil, but a very smart, intellectual um, person that can see it all right, but yet spirit, the mind inside. And it's always when we not give a word demons, I mean, it could be deception. That's our world today. It's just darkness and it's deception. A lot of us, or many of us, are walking and we're just being deceived. And um, God is the only one that's got that true life, that, that light show us the truth and the reality. You know, even with the fires in California, I always thought it was just the irony of the cult, a place called paradise. You know, and many of us are dreaming of paradise and working towards paradise, but I think God is saying the paradise we dream of is really hell, you know? Amen. We just gotta open up our eyes and see it's consuming us. So true. Amazing. Get all the hands. Let's go ahead and read this next section. Leviticus 17, 10 through 14. Now this is this is powerful because we've been dealing with this. If you didn't get to see the video, that um, blue crab and the blue blood. There is sanctity in the blood. Fifteen thousand dollars for that blood that comes from that blue crab or that crab uh, with the blue blood. Um, look at that commentary. On the positive side, this law guarded the sanctity of life, which was in the blood. So God has put. The blood is a life story. We, we, we have our blood drives. 
They say, give the gift of what? Life. Wow, isn't that? Give the gift of life. So that whole process, very important to think about it. God already had defined this. The blood was what God ordained should make the atonement. Verse 11. It was his. So the blood is his. He gives us. I taught in our 8 o'clock service on um, babies and the umbilical cord. And I learned with the umbilical cord, there are two arteries and a vein within that umbilical cord. And that blood is filtered through the mother's placenta. And that whole process, it's a lifeline. If that, if that umbilical cord is cut too quickly, that, that child dies because of the blood. That's so powerful when the way God has created that. Therefore, it must be treated properly. Animals killed by the priests at the tabernacle entrance would have their blood properly drained and poured out, not what? Yeah, even now, um, um, those that are over in the Israel community, the Israelite community, um, not Messianic Jews, but they still do sacrifices from time to time. And those sacrifices, the blood is so important. So they have to actually slit the throat in a proper way. All right, so it's supposed to be humane, but they realize the blood. If you think about demonic movies that you've seen, one big component is the blood. All right, you think about those. It's always pictured and connected with some kind of blood, blood everywhere, or, or, or holding blood, or even drinking blood, right? You think about vampires and stuff like drinking blood, you're like, ooh. But if those are the top, because there is life in the blood, very powerful. Yes, sir? Uh, I, uh, most of us here, when we go to the doctor or the hospital, the first thing they want to taste is your blood. You're right. Because the blood can tell everything about you. You're right. If one little tube, there you are. And they can tell everything about you from, from your blood. No blood. I was made with telling them the whole story. From your blood. You're right. The well, life's in the blood. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know whether this is true or false, but a place down right on the road, if you go to line it up on holidays and before holidays, and they say they're selling the blood. Okay. You're right. They line it up. I mean, they just going in and out. And going, I'm sitting, my wife going in shopping in the store, and I'm sitting there. I don't have anything. I'm just sitting there in the video watching. And I've never seen the wife. Young and old. And, that's, and I understand that it's a selling in blood. And my thing is, I'm not asking about answer this, but if I want to take part in the cell, do that. Kind of scary. What's that call, Tab? They just slipped me the part of the blood that they're actually selling. Plasma. It's a portion of the blood, um, and which it's powerful. It is powerful, life-giving process. And so, big money is being made by people. Um, there's some that you may be in here not putting it down. They know they you have to recover for a period of time, but they've got it on the cycle. And so they, they recover it, and they go in there and hook up again. And, and they're getting money for that blood, which we can say definitely there is life. God knew what he was doing with the blood, but maybe demons hang out there too. I, I don't know. I mean, there's an exchange. Anywhere there's an exchange of blood in any type, um, things can transfer. That's why when you go to the hospital, when they, any kind of fluids, man, now they're putting gloves on, but especially blood. If blood is involved, people are really serious about that because there can be so many transfer of diseases of all types. Yes, ma'am. Some people do that. Um, she brings out a point. Um, I think it's Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in um, transfer uh, blood. And so some of them actually save their blood. So they'll give blood over their life and they'll put it in blood blanks. So if they get sick, they can get their same blood back in. Um, I thank God for people who do. I've given blood and, and you know, some people in my family have had to have blood. Thank God for those who give that. But we need to think about there is life again. God knew what he was doing when he talks about it in Leviticus. Yes, ma'am. Right, right. So some people have died over that. Did I get all the hands? Yes, ma'am. 
Wow. If we were living in the Old Testament, yes. Any type of blood um, would be against the law. Now, we understand the laws of the Israelites. New Testament, Jesus has paid it off. But yes, technically, any type of blood, if you were in the Old Testament, you were against the law. You could not eat the blood because you weren't recognized. That meat would have to be cooked all the way through, all right, um, for that process. So, yes, Old Testament, but thank God we're in the New Testament. Some of you like a little tenderness, a little redness, and some of you like, oh, I can't stand that. But we understand. Thank God, again, for God's grace in that. Good point. Yes, ma'am. That's good if you have foresight to do that. Um, look at this next part. Leviticus 17, 15, and 16. Someone read, please. And every person who eats what died, that was torn by that commentary it was possible that a man might eat an animal that had died by itself or at the horns of another beast all right um, meaning that the blood would not have been properly cared for so God was really big he wanted them to realize all blood is important all right all blood is important if that were discovered that man had to undergo the ritual cleansing process so as you can see here, you see the animals come together. So if one killed the other one and, and that blood wasn't taken care of, the animal wasn't taken care of properly, literally um, you, could, you could be going against the law and you'd have to go to the ritual clean. Uh, I remember my um, grandpa, Hazel, uh, since I'm talking about him, um, he's, there was a, a deer that got hit on the road. <laughs> and I slipped the laugh. It really was like Christmas. <laughs> it was, yeah, a deer got hit on the road. So my grandpa stopped the car, picked up the deer, threw it in the back of the car, brought it home, and cooked it for us. And served it. And so if we were in the Old Testament, that would not be kosher. That would not be right. He did not do that thing right. It was not bled right. But he was like, it was fresh, you know, and so he just threw it back in there. But this is the whole process. Again, thank God for Jesus. Look at this next one. Yes, ma'am, Mother Wisdom. I was going to say, growing up when I was at home, my dad made me see a hog. And I was like, oh, that's not right. And I was like, oh, You're right. See, so we see that process. All right, let's look at this next part. Um, we're we're, we're going to kind of press through it. We've got about 10 or 15 more minutes, but I'm glad we got to the, with the group we have. PG-13. All right, we're going to do the laws of sexuality. So uh, some of our young people woke up like, we're going to talk about sex? We're going to talk about sex? Yes, Old Testament, we do. We talk about sex. So we're going to this section, PG-13. Someone jump in, Leviticus 18, 1 through 3. Someone read, please. Alright, so this is kind of introduction when we're dealing with these sexuality things. He's saying when you go into the promised land, the Canaanites are going to be doing some stuff that you, you can't pick up. Alright? We, we brought you, we, we bring you out of all of this. You are to be set apart. The more regulations which follow are grounded in God's declaration. I am the Lord your God. Verse 2. Israel's conduct is not to be patterned after either the Egyptians or the Canaanites. 
both of whom they had practiced not compatible with the nature of a holy God, and a people who were to exhibit that likeness as his sons and daughters. Now this is critical. We've got to think in our society, what has God said about sexuality, and what has the world said about sexuality? Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it's, it's tough. It is tough because I'm seeing a change. There used to be an agreement of what was wrong. You know, you knew if you were having sex out of marriage, it was wrong. Things are changing now. Preachers don't talk about it because they're afraid of homosexuality. It, it was pretty, pretty. if you were male, you were male. If you were female, you are female. And, and the two just didn't mix, at least in a public manner, uh, to argue. Every, even the homosexuality, they, they were like, yeah, I'm homosexual and da-da-da, this is not good, but I'm going to live this way. But now, things have just changed. There is mixed that now people don't even know if they're he or she. Literally, people are saying, call me it. And so the sexuality is embarking on our whole society. How do we deal with that? God wanted to make sure that the Israelites understood what was going on. So let's go to this next part, Leviticus 18, 4 and 5. Someone read, please. Alright, lead into this. If you do it my way, you're going to what? Live. Live. If you don't do it my way, then you're going to die. Keep that in mind. The solemnity of uh, these verses cannot be overemphasized. These are God's laws and they must be obeyed. You ready? Leviticus 18.6. Someone read, please. Wow, um, it's a little joke. A lot of times we talk about this in West Virginia, you know. Uh, but this is a scientific thing, and those regulations have been released for the, for the most part. Just doing some study on this, but it used to be there was a study of your kin. You had to make sure that you did not marry close, first cousins or anything of that sort, because what can come out of that? Birth, birth defects. This was known. This was common knowledge. But now our society is really switching and they're, they don't say much with these things. So you can kind of marry and it's just sad. We become so confused over political correctness. What is forbidden here in a summary declaration is to uncover their nakedness, referring to those who are near of kin. That marriage uh, to one who is near kin is what is prohibited here. It's clear from verse 18 where it prohibits taking a sister of one's wife as an additional wife, uncovering her nakedness, while the first one still lives. It is not just illicit sexual relations with near of kin that are forbidden. They are already forbidden with any person other than one's own wife in the seventh commandment, Exodus 20:14. The Egyptians frequently married the near of kin mentioned in this chapter, and the Canaanites practiced immoral rites with near of kin. God wants his people to be what? Right. He wanted to make sure they didn't pick up these traits. It is not certain that any biological or genetic considerations are in the view in these laws, even though some feel that uh, barrenness, a barrenness or weak offspring might result from such unions. It seems that moral and social standards are the chief ends of these regulations. So God is setting up these standards, but we see again, as we talked about before, scientifically, things can come out of this. Um, God knows what he's talking about. Leviticus 18, 7 and 8, someone read. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother, you shall not uncover. She is your mother, you shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife, you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. Somebody say, ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's, it, this is. We, we understand that intuitively, but listen to your news. This is becoming more so. Some of you, sad to say, want to talk about it, have gone through counseling because a family member, or maybe yourself, have been molested by a father or something has happened with a mother. This is becoming prevalent. I, I'm telling you, some families, some families that are connected with us, you know it's happened. And it's kind of been hush-hush, 
Some have been in prison, but this is becoming more prevalent. I can't even imagine that. I can't imagine that, but we started out talking with demons. When you allow demons to come in, this is the kind of stuff that you get. The principle. Don't know if he did it or not, because he killed himself, but 12-year-old child. I mean, and I know kids are looking older, but 12 years old. You know, rape, abuse, all of these things. And you're like, what's going on? What's happening with our society? God has said this. He's put certain things over sexuality because when demons come in, things can go crazy. Look at this. What is forbidden is marriage to one's who? Mother. Mother. But it shames the honor of the father because of the one flesh relationship he has had with that wife. A stepmother is in view in verse 8. So we're going to be dealing with it in deeper. I don't want to even tell you some movies, but some movies are presently on the screen right now that are dealing with a child and a mother having relations. And this is becoming accepted in our society. This is the people are buying tickets to go out and see these relationships now on our public screen. Our public screen. Before this was misnomer, it was happening, but now this has been sold as a product. It's seen as freeness, free love, opening up ourselves and sharing ourselves. This is what's, and God forbid it, but now it is coming back in. Yeah. But just looking at this society, women weren't viewed as anything. They were viewed as property. So go and get in your mother or your father's wife was like going to get in his cow or, you know, sheep or pig. So he's outlines, outlining some very crucial things. There's just some things that you don't do. They're not property. You need to be treating people with respect. Things that we so quote unquote prize in our society at the moment um, were something revolutionary for this time. Setting up parameters. When you lose your parameters, anything goes. And we're seeing that. Someone read a big section of Scripture Tabitha. Go ahead and get that. Leviticus 18, 9 through 17. The nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, or the born of home or elsewhere, their nakedness you shall not uncover. The nakedness of your sister's daughter, or of your daughter's daughter, your nakedness you shall not uncover, for there is your own nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, begotten by your father, she is your sister. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. Before I read that commentary, why does God have to tell them this? Because it's sin. God, God knows if He doesn't give us parameters without God's Holy Spirit, we'll do stupid stuff. Amen. 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 Phil. Also, at that time, it's a bit more confusing than it is now why a lot of parameters were taken off scientifically it's because we're all mixed in with all these different cultures and people so back then if you're an Israelite technically the person that even lives that you haven't even talked about for a really long time is possibly the same connection to you as a stepsister or stepbrother genetically so understand okay set apart this person who married this person had this kid this is your sister, this is your mother, this is your son-in-law. So they say, okay, if they go, well, you know, I have feelings for her and we're not really related because they were born over here. No, 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 I'm going to explain to you. This is how the birth thing works, this is how relations work. So if they were born from them, no matter where they were born at, no matter how it was, here are your parameters of who you can marry and who you can't marry, no matter the location, just the relations between them. God is good. We're so dumb. We are. We do. We just if if we take God out and we just do it our own way, we got craziness. We got mayhem, which it seems to be coming back. Let's get this final scripture. Or uh, various relationships are covered in these verses, including a half sister 
or stepsister, verse 9, granddaughter, verse 10, half-sister, or perhaps full sister, verse 11, aunt, verses 12 to 13, wife of a blood uncle, verse 14, daughter-in-law, verse 15, sister-in-law, verse 16, and a woman and her daughter or granddaughter, verse 17. Let's get this final one, Leviticus 18, 18. Someone read, please. This is interesting, thinking about the parameters. So it's saying, all right, so I can take another sister. Somebody would say, well, I want to get back at my current wife. So I'm going to marry her sister. So if Bianca had a sister and Bianca was bad, I'd just go marry her sister just to make Bianca understand how wonderful a man I am and she need to get right. And this would be a rival sister. You know, in that, and, and God said, I know your sin nature. You're going to do this, but I'm going to tell you not to do that. Look at that commentary. One cannot be married to what? Two sisters. Amen. <laughs> this, this, excuse me, Mother May, but this ain't talking just black folks. This ain't talking about two sister blacks, all right? This is talking about two <laughs> genetically sisters, all right? You could not. This was against the law. This was against the law. You could not do this. All right, God put it. This forbids divorcing a woman in order to marry her or what? Doesn't that be sad? I come in a few weeks. He said, where is B at? I got tired of it, so I married her sister. Everything will be all right. This, I said, don't do this. This is the sin nature. This is sin nature. However, when one's wife is no longer living, he may marry his first wife's sister. The probable reason why the regular term for getting married is not used throughout this chapter is that God would not consider these unions to be true marriages. Thus, the common terminology is to uncover her nakedness. Amen? Amen. We're finished for the night. Go ahead, get your run. Yes, sir. Don't, be, don't get too deep, please. Sure. <laughs> All right. sure, I don't understand how that two Two men or two, two ladies can call it marriage. You know, I'm sure. Right. I don't understand how they call it marriage. Because male and female is married. Correct. I right. understand that. But they call it marriage. When we get away from God's law and his regulations, what he calls marriage, then we can call whatever we want to call. Um, Deacon Rudd, we're going to get into a portion of scripture, maybe not next time, but we're going to talk about, well, we might, bestiality. Um, people will, and in our society now, are marrying animals. So, so you, you think female and female, male and male, what if somebody, what if you see on your shows that this guy or this lady decides to marry their dog, and they have a big ceremony, and then they want to do it in a church? Well, this is where we are right now in our society. Thank God for giving us parameters. Come on to your feet. Let's close out. Thank you for coming out. We're going to just grab some hands, make a, a smaller circle of 90.